On Christmas evening in 2018, a huge fire rose up from Kandahar's Anomena neighborhood. At first, some people thought it was a Christmas party held by the neighborhood's hard partying elite of drug dealers, warlords, and spies. Then, they heard the gunshots ring out as insurgents from the Taliban linked Haqqani network battled their way past the guards towards a dark home at the end of the complex. I'm guessing the celebrations that night took place some 700 kilometers away at the Inter-Service Intelligence's headquarters in Rawalpindi. The attack had claimed the life of a man called Aslam Achu, the most important Baloch insurgent commander who had harried Pakistan's intelligence services for years from his Afghan citadel. Like a bad dream though, the ghost of the slain insurgent resurfaced this week as the men Aslam had prepared and trained stormed Pakistani military outposts at Panjgur and Noshki in Balochistan. Nine soldiers at least are reported to have been killed in a battle that raged for days, shattering illusions that the Baloch insurgency's back had been broken that Christmas day in 2018. And that makes us ask the question, why is it that Pakistan's army has found it so difficult to crush the country's oldest insurgency. Last week's strike by the Baloch Liberation Army has fueled speculation that the left-leaning nationalist insurgent group has maybe tied up or been influenced by regional jihadi organizations. The truth is that the BLA's Majid Fidayin Brigade named, the story has it, for a Baloch soldier who attempted once to assassinate Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto has been active for at least 20 years before what happened last week, placed it under the arc lights of international media attention. In December 2011, using a car bomb driven by a suicide attacker, the Majid Fidayim Brigade attempted to assassinate former Pakistani minister Nazir Mengal at his home in Quetta. The bombing killed 13 people and injured 30. Then in August 2018, the BLA killed three Chinese engineers in a strike at Dalbandin. Later in 2018, the same group attacked the Chinese mission in Karachi. The Fidayin Brigade was founded by Takari Muhammad Aslam, the real name of that insurgent killed in Kandahar. Born in 1975, Aslam had emerged from the ranks of a new generation of educated, urbanized young Baloch who stood apart from the region's traditional tribal structure. Like many of his generation, Aslam harbored deep resentment against ethnic Punjabi immigrants to Balochistan, who were claimed to be cornering economic opportunities and arable lands. In his late teens, Aslam became involved in Baloch nationalist circles. Later, he began attending a study circle led by Kher Baksh Murray, a prominent left-wing Baloch politician who had himself just returned to Pakistan in 1994 after two decades in exile. From around 2000, recruiting from these study circles, Aslam helped create the BLA and ran its first training base in Bolan. The BLA at its peak is thought to have drawn in several hundred, maybe thousands of volunteers, among them Aslam's own son Rehan, who was killed in the 2018 attack on the Chinese engineers. The BLA, however, proved incapable of mounting a sustained insurgent campaign. In 2006, Aslam led the group's remnants across the border into Afghanistan. BLA leaders, Islamabad has long alleged, began receiving assistance from Afghanistan's intelligence services as retaliation, of course, against Pakistan's own sponsorship of the Taliban, as well as from India's research and analysis wing. In 2016, it's been reported, Aslam was even treated for combat injuries at the Max Hospital in New Delhi's Saket. Following the triumph of the Taliban last year, however, the BLA lost its safe haven in southern Afghanistan and many believed the insurgent group was about to be consigned to history once and for all. Like so many other South Asian insurgencies, the conflict in Balochistan was rooted in the efforts of post-independence governments to stamp their authority over polities where the British Empire had only a loose influence. In 1947, Mir Ahmad Yar Khan the ruler of the what was then the quasi-independent state of Balochistan declared formal independence rather than join Pakistan. In March 1948, Pakistan sent in its military to settle the issue. Remember, this happened in India also, in so-called princely states like Hyderabad. 
Even though the Khan made peace with Pakistan, his younger brothers, Agha Abdul Karim Baloch and Muhammad Rahim Baloch, refused to stop fighting. The Dosht e Jhalawan insurgent group harried the Pakistan army until well into the 1950s. Following the India Pakistan War of 1971, Pakistan moved to kind of settle these ethnic tensions. Soon after, though, the tensions resurfaced again. Scholars Gulshan Majid and Rehana Hashmi have recorded. The Awami National Party, which won provincial elections in Balochistan, irritated Prime Minister Zulfikar Ali Bhutto by evicting ethnic Punjabis from the civil services and setting up its own local police force. Then in 1972, armed clashes broke out between the supporters of Federal Interior Minister Abdul Qayyum Khan and the National Awami Party. Islamabad alleged that key regional leaders like Ataullah Mengal and Abdul Wali Khan had conspired in London to declare independence with Indian help. The path was thus cleared for outright war. Led by the Balochi People's Liberation Front and the Balochi Students' Organization, thousands of guerrillas took on six entire divisions of the Pakistan army. Tens of thousands of civilians, along with an estimated 5,300 insurgents and 3,300 troops, are estimated to have been killed. From early in 2005, a fresh wake of, of insurgency broke out following military ruler General Parvez Musharraf's refusal to prosecute a military officer alleged to have raped a local doctor. Insurgents loyal to the tribal leader Nawab Akbar Khan Bukti, who ironically in 1973 had lined up against the nationalist insurgents, responded by storming the Sui gas fields, one of Pakistan's biggest energy resources. Insurgents also besiege dozens of military outposts, just as they have done now. General Musharraf had responded with threats. Don't push us, he warned. It isn't the 1970s when you can hit and run in the mountains. This time you won't even know what hit you. Like in the 1970s though, this kind of hardline language only ended up precipitating another insurgency. In 2002, General Musharraf had engineered the electoral victory of an Islamist coalition, the Mutahida Majlis-e Amal. The famous journalist Najam Sethi has noted this alienated, I quote, the old non-religious tribal leadership as well as the new secular urban middle classes of Balochistan who saw no political space for themselves in the new military mullah dispensation. Eventually, the insurgents were crushed and Bukti himself was slain. The core of the insurgents though slipped over the border into Afghanistan details have emerged on how the BLA rebuilt itself in Afghanistan from 2006 on. Elements of the parallel Baloch insurgency in Iran, the scholar Antonio Guistosi has written, had developed ties with the Islamic State in Afghanistan. In addition, some ethnic Baloch criminal organizations played a role trafficking narcotics from the opium heartlands of southern Afghanistan into Iran for the Taliban. Perhaps, conceivably, these linkages helped the BLA to acquire access to weapons, training and funding. Whatever the truth, it's now emerged as a serious threat to Pakistan yet again. To governments everywhere, the message should be a simple one. Force alone isn't a substitute for meaningful political action on grievances like those the Baloch have. Despite the extrajudicial execution of thousands of Baloch civilians, as well as large-scale torture and a thoroughgoing media crackdown, this insurgency is refusing to die. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm National Security Editor of The Print.